Hello, happy Halloween. This is Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. I am Catherine Troyer, and joining me is Anthony Tresca. Hey there. So this is a podcast devoted to thoughtful discussions about that fine line between the horrific and the horrible. Each episode looks at a specific horror text that is, for better or worse, giving us nightmares. And we are so excited and thankful for you to be joining us for our super spooktacular spooky season special over 2018's Halloween. It was very impressive. There was a lot of a lot of alliteration there that you got through very successfully. Thank you. I I uh, I wrote that down as soon as you told me that we were going to be referring to these episodes as spooktacular. Um, I was like, there's so many words that start with S. This is our second Halloween episode, both both Halloween for the holiday, but also Halloween for the franchise. Mm-hmm. And I like to refer to these in my head as convincing Anthony that he's so horribly wrong in his gentle to extreme levels of dislike for the horror Halloween franchise. Interesting, because I also think of these episodes in a very particular way. It's... Um... Katie tries to get me against my will to like a beloved franchise that I have no interest in. Excellent. <laughs> and so what what will happen is is it will be up to whoever is the victor to determine how we read this these series. So it's true. So some way down the road, after I've convinced you that you have not given these films the chance they deserve, uh, we will refer to them as the the victory of Halloween. So I guess until for right now, we'll just keep referring to them as just Halloween. Yeah, just just <laughs> Halloween. That, that seems like a pretty good option. So for those of you who didn't listen to our delightful Halloween episode, um, to which, Anthony, I should tell you, I had people listen and they were also Halloween fans. And they were like, that Anthony has some good ideas, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. So uh, I'm, used to, I'm used to people saying that. <laughs> so because the passion is so real. Um, but... Uh, Halloween, we had a whole episode on the first one and basically talked about, you know, the reasons that it has achieved sort of this legendary status and the reasons that for Anthony, uh, even though it has achieved that that sort of cult classic status, that maybe it's not as deserving of that title as, um, which we would both agree, uh, is the best of the franchises, and that is Nightmare on Elm Street. It's true. Um, I, I actually... Before recording this, I, I had just recently rewatched Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, I just needed a palate cleanser after having to watch this Halloween movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if that doesn't cue you into how I feel about this movie as well, um, I don't know. <laughs> so I, you know, I really like the Halloween franchise, and I will, as I will be saying, you know, really actually very much enjoy uh, the 2018 film. But I, I won't lie. Um, Eventually, we need to, to work our way through the, the Nightmare franchise, uh, because then we have an excuse to watch them all again. In the meantime, though, we're going to talk about Halloween 2018, which in our my home um, was you know a much anticipated event, in large part, not just because we like Halloween and we and, you know, that sort of the mythos there. But I won't lie. A big part of it is Jamie Lee Curtis. And so you mm-hmm. have to like. At the very least, it's a couple hours that you get to spend with Jamie Lee Curtis. It's true. I I do like Jamie Lee Curtis. I, I liked her in the original Halloween. I liked her in this Halloween. I've liked her in just about everything I've seen her in. She's always a delight. And I mean, yeah, you're you're right. I mean, at, at least these movies have Jamie Lee Curtis. And I think the, the franchise is aware of that. And, and you can kind of tr- uh, see a trajectory. So even though Halloween 2018 uh, completely rejects all of the films that happened between that film and the 1978 film, um, they do exist, right? <laughs> they don't not exist. And, and you can see it in the trajectory of 
the film's relying more and more on Jamie Lee Curtis's ability to to really bring to life a very well-rounded um, and complex character. And of course, she's not in all the films, but the ones that are my favorite of the franchise are the ones where where she's given increasingly bigger sort of stakes um, in the game. So that's a point in his favor, but obviously not enough of a point for you to to feel that this film was an experience that you will cherish forever. So, Anthony, let's begin with, do you remember what you, what you gave in terms of, like, your, your ratings for the 78 film? Yes, I do. I, I gave the original 1978 Halloween film a two out of five stars. Ooh, that's rough. Um, do you remember what you gave the 2018 film? Yes, I gave it one and a half stars. No, no. Oh. Uh, yeah, it, it's a case of diminishing returns. Same name, similar actors, not as good this time. And I, in my opinion, it already was starting from something that I didn't particularly enjoy. Although, again, as you mentioned, I do have a, a particular appreciation and an acknowledgement for Halloween, the original 1978 in the larger context and development of horror films yet to come. It clearly did a lot for the genre and it clearly had a huge influence. And because of it, in my opinion, better films were able to be made down the line. Halloween 2018 is not one of those better films that I think came from it. I find myself I'm so sad. Like I'm, I'm deep in my heart. It's like you, you told me, guess what I did the other day? I kicked a tiny defenseless newborn animal. Like I feel at that level of, of sad. I don't, I feel, I mean like that end podcast over. Oh. <laughs> well, you no, 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 you've got to, you've got to at least let me defend myself because right now I know I've pissed off a lot of our, a lot of our listeners. Cause I can't even I know- be pissed off though. I'm just sad. Like I'm so fundamentally sad. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I knew you didn't like it. I thought you liked it better. I don't, I don't even know where to begin. Okay, let's. Where to, where do we begin from that darkness? Um, let's talk about things that you liked. So- okay, I can't. This is this is easy for me. I do know what I liked about this film. I think that the final act of this film, when you have the three uh, female protagonists of different generations coming together to take on Michael Myers in Laurie's weird kind of like bunkery house is really well done. In, I, in fact, I'm, there's no there's no butt coming. I just genuinely do really enjoy that whole sequence. The mannequin sequence in this film is very well shot. It's very well acted and it's very it's really excellent. And I just enjoy seeing those three female protagonists teaming up and joining forces to take on Michael Myers. I think it is incredibly satisfying. And I, and I will say that that is hands down my favorite part of this film as well. And, it, and it's my favorite part of the film for a couple of reasons. One, as you said, um, our performances from our three, uh, you know, leading ladies is, is very strong in that component. I think it does a good job of pulling together the threads that or the, the threads that has been setting up. Um, throughout the film and as somebody who studies not just the horror genre but specifically the home in horror I appreciate the way that it culminates because it there's some really interesting studies um, on the home that are particularly from the feminist lens where they talk about the fact that you know the thing is is that um, we often see the home as being this domestic heaven but we have to understand that that's not the case for all women Right. I mean, that's for some women, the place that is defined as the quintessential feminine space is actually the, the space that is, is the most prison like in their existence. And so I appreciated the fact that the film found a way to talk about through that last element without having to to always explicitly say so, although there are a couple lines that are explicit. This idea that, you know, that the home is a complicated space and it is a complicated space for women. Um, And so I really appreciated that. And and so I can tell you that a good chunk of my enjoyment of the film stems from the last 
20 minutes or so, or like you said, the last act. I think that that is, that that, in my opinion, outweighs what are going to be maybe some of the minor flaws in the film. So I, I want to keep extending this, that, that conversation because I, yeah, I think it is what they're able to do there is they have those three female characters who all have three different relations to the home at that particular point in time. You have a single woman in Jamie Lee Curtis's Lori, who has had a, obviously a clearly traumatic experience um, in the home and is thus extremely afraid and guards her home and is very guarded. Then you have uh, Judy Greer's character, who is the mother, who is much more uh, I, I'm domestic in the, has a more of a domestic relation to the home, and you see uh, her in her heteronormative lifestyle living that kind of fox american dream esque like almost this 1950s ideal of the nuclear family playing out and then you have her daughter who is less content with this her mother's idea of domesticity and the nuclear family and staying at home so it's really it is very interesting this seeing these three people in in a home three different generations three very different ideas of what makes a home that and for that i will give the movie credit i will also say you and i've talked before we actually talked about this um in relationship specifically with our episode on the babysitter killer queen about trauma narratives and the way that trauma is increasingly becoming a component of horror in a way that some of the more traditional slasher films didn't didn't go there or feel the need to go there I think franchises often need to. But I I find the premise of of what of the consequences or the repercussions that happen after the credits roll um to be very interesting, right? Like I find that idea of like but what happens next to be one that that has not for me personally reached its potential like I'm still willing to, to go there and anytime a text be it a film or a book you know has has that sort of element of like they survived the horror um, but but what's going to happen next I find that very intriguing and I also I appreciated that element of the film as well yeah I mean I well this is where we, it begins to get a touch bit dicier for me because I also enjoy seeing what happens after the credits. And I think that that is a very intriguing idea. And sometimes it's done very well, or it's just so different from the previous film. And what happens after this, that credit is so insanely different, like in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise or in Evil Dead, where what happens after the credits is in the next film is so different and bizarre and interesting that you can get sucked into it. However, what I feel they've decided to do with this 2018 adaptation of Halloween uh, and taking this idea of what happened after the credits is, well, many years later, the same thing will happen again after the credits. Because I feel that ultimately, what I find found so disappointing about this 2018 adaptation of Halloween is that it essentially is a copy and paste version of the original Halloween. And until that final, um, third act with the three females, nothing that it introduced to modernize or to differentiate itself from the original 1978 film worked in my opinion. And so any additional elements that they added just actually weighed the film down. And it made me, I, I don't wanna say I'm more fond of the 1978 film now, but actually, actually yes, I do wanna say that. This film seeing just how how it can look if it's just a lazily copy and paste it again and tried to be updated for modern times did make me appreciate the original film more. So I guess that could be maybe a win for you. No, it's, it's not. <laughs> so I, I hear what you're saying and I, I think you're bringing up a good point and it's very interesting because what you see is sort of a, a sloppy copy and paste. I see as more of a homage, right? That that what the film is doing is it's saying, remember that babysitter scene that you liked so much? Well, we're going to put that in there and the outcome's going to be the same at the end of the day. But, um, you know, we are going to remind you that some of our horror tropes have changed. So, for example, um, you know, we, 
we have that conversation between the little boy and the babysitter that would not have been in uh, the 1978 one. And, and not just because that's not what the film would have done, but also because um, the film is aware of the fact that we have a tradition, problematically so, within horror films of killing off our, our people of color. And so the film is saying, okay, we, we're not going to do that because we, we know that's, that's silly, but what would happen if everything else was the same? And so I don't know. I saw it as them, maybe not always successfully, but but kind of playing with some of the the traditional elements that they actually helped to create for the horror genre, um, and and just kind of but doing it in a way that felt authentic to the Halloween voice, but still acknowledged that it's now a trope rather than um, something that was being created at that time. Does that make sense? I think it does make sense. However, this it still is ultimately unsatisfying to me, even though I can, I do recognize that they are making references to these tropes and these larger things that, as you brought up, they in some way were a part of establishing themselves. However, that for me is the, is the equivalent of like in a comedy film in which they will make a reference to something else and that's the whole joke. Like when you'll just make a, a reference to a superhero movie and you're like, well, isn't it funny that I referenced that superhero movie that everybody's seen? And you're like, well, that wasn't a joke. That was just a reference. And a lot of the scenes in this film felt like references for references sake, where it was like, look audience, you remember this because you saw Halloween and you liked it. You see what we're doing now? That's good, right? And it's like, no, it's just, you've just done the trope. Or you, And sometimes I think, Unfortunately for me, it feels less even than just like they're doing it for that sake and they are doing it to have commentary on the trope and show how time has passed. And sometimes it just feels like, oh, we need to make ourselves a little bit different from the original. So we need to introduce a scene here that we didn't see in the original. Like, for example, in the car scene with the two people uh, who are driving up on the accident where Michael Myers happened. We got a similar scene to that in the original 1978 film, but now in this one, we have a conversation between Lumpy and his dad where Lumpy wants to be a dancer. He doesn't want to fish with his dad on week on weekdays. He's fine on the weekends, but he doesn't want to do it on weekdays. So I understand why they're doing this scene. They want to introduce human elements into this scene that weren't present in the original 1978 film. However, what the film fails to answer is why we should ha see humans in this scene. It just puts them there, but doesn't do anything with them. I love that scene. Oh my God, I thought it, I, I thought it was ridiculous. I was, I was laughing, not with it, at it. That was part of, part of what, why I love the scene though, right? Is that I love it because it's so awkward and it's so obvious. So I don't want to say because I can't I can't and don't want to speak for the filmmakers, right? And so I don't want to imply that they either missed the mark because they weren't thinking about it or that they were like so crafty that they, you know, purposely built it built in a moment that would feel clunky and awkward. But so so independent of them though, I think for me what I appreciate about this film is that whether or not regardless of intentionality the film felt like an answer to the question of what would happen if I, what would happen in a viewing of Halloween when I've been living with Halloween for as long as I have? And, and the answer is, is that, you know, I'm going to expect some of the same things. I'm going to want a little bit more quirk, um, though, and a, and a few more moments that are just going to feel over the top because um, you know, that's, that's where we've been taught things should go next. But I also want that sort of like trauma aspect. So for me, it, and I think really it comes down to, I don't think this film is going to work for anyone that's not a fan of Halloween and it's not even going to work for everyone that is a fan. Right. Um, but I don't know if anyone will like this film if they didn't at least appreciate on a sort of more fundamental level than you did Halloween. And I think that's a, I think that that is unfortunate and a problem 
because I do think that there is a story in he, that they present that is worth telling and is interesting enough to sustain. I think that the playing with Jamie Lee Curtis's character and this traumatized, broken person who has clearly turned and gone to some incredibly dark places and is really fascinating. And I think Jamie Lee Curtis does a really good job with that. However, weirdly enough, even though Jamie Lee Curtis is the star of this film, she's not in it that much. Instead, they focus on, they go to these other, they do these other scenes with the lumpy or whatever, or the, the kid who with the babysitter, Julian and his babysitter. For some reason, they have these scenes in there that, again, we just talked about why they're in there. And But rather than just have those scenes and those references and the, those updating of these tropes, if that's the interpretation you want to take with those scenes, I would have much rather just had more time dedicated to Jamie Lee Curtis and seeing what was going on. Because I never felt that we, as much as I was appreciated everything Jamie Lee Curtis was doing, and I, I liked her character, I never felt we went deep enough with her character. I wanted so much more. So I think if I can, can make one criticism of the film that's not going to detract from, from my appreciation of it, it would be linked to what you're saying and that is that I I think that this film in some ways is is haunted by by its Halloween past in that they if they were going to make a Halloween film it needed to still be fundamentally at the end of the day a slasher film right mm -hmm. um and and the truth is is that you're right that would have made for a delightful movie but that would have made for a movie that would have been in a very different genre um, of horror than than the original Halloween, and and we've talked, you know, about the fact that like with Evil Dead that works really effectively, um, and because they just kind of radically broke free, but it doesn't always. I'm not sure, for example, Killer Queen, which tried to introduce a couple new like generic elements, that film actually failed by not sticking with what worked, and so I think that there's some tension here. Uh, between what you're describing as the film's potential, which is this new content, um, and the film's sort of tra traditional elements that I, I think people felt it needed to have in order to be a Halloween film. So I think I, again, probably because I feel much less sentimental ties to the original 1978 film, um, I was excited actually the walk before I watched this film because I thought that it was going to be the film I just described because that's how it was marketed. That's the, the film, the film's marketing. I remember it back in 2018 was incredibly focused on Jamie Lee Curtis. And we thought, I thought it was going to be the Jamie Lee Curtis show. Um, and we were really going to be, they had decided to make this film because they had, a, they realized that there was this story, Jamie Lee Curtis's story that was worth telling. And so I was really intrigued by that. I was like, that's interesting. You, to revisit this franchise um, 40 years later um, and tell this very specific character-driven story was really compelling to me. And then it was ultimately so un unsatisfying when instead I just got this generic Halloween light film. And what will be interesting, and, and of course, you know, thanks COVID for preventing us from having the movie this year. Um, it'll be interesting to see where Halloween Kills, which will come out hopefully in our lifetime, um, <laughs> will do. Because what I think would be intriguing, but I must admit I worry because this would be a, a real radical departure from what Blumhouse has traditionally done. Um is if they used the 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 Halloween twenty eighteen as their sort of um, metamorphosis period, right? So uh, you know we have Halloween, which is one hundred percent sort of defining the slasher film, alongside films like uh, Friday the Thirteenth and Nightmare on Elm Street, and then we have Halloween twenty eighteen, which is you know um, in the ugly like cocoon state where it's neither butterfly nor uh, caterpillar still, and then Halloween kills could then become the film that you that you're describing and that I think the franchise deserves to go because we we deserve to see um 
to see that metamorphosis of, and and it is capable of being if i'm going to extend it this mother, metaphor even further a butterfly i don't think though that that is going to be a gamble that that they're going to take because we're talking about an incredible gamble because you're going to probably not draw in any new people right you're not going to probably have anyone that's going to say you know what I haven't seen any of the other Halloweens, but I'll check out Halloween Kills. Um, so you're relying on your Halloween audience, but for the most part, they're still really, really okay with the slasher formula. That's true. I mean, the critical response, critical as well as the audience response to this film was mostly positive. Rotten Tomatoes, it got a 79 is, and is certified fresh by critics, 70 uh, percent by audiences. Metacritic score 67, user score 6.8. On IMDb, it's got a 6.5, and Letterbox, it's sitting at a 3.2. So, I mean, it's pretty, you're right. I mean, this formula clearly does work for some people, particularly as you're describing fans of Halloween and slasher films of that, of that type. So, what we'll have to see is, is, is that is the conclusion of Halloween 2018 the, well, we'll just beat this metaphor to death, um, the like emerging of the cocoon and it's beginning to flap its beautiful little wings, or is this more of an anomaly, right? Something that kind of happened at the end that's beautiful, um, but definitely not part of the evolution. Um, and, and of course, until 2022 now, um, or no, 2021, it says. Um, we're not going to ever get to to know, right, uh, where that is. But I take it, based on your depressing score, that there are other things that you would like to talk about that you have problems with. Well, I mean, I've spoken about larger problems with it. And another problem that is so, so interesting to me is... I don't understand how this franchise has taken the idea, this Michael Myers character, this psychopath, um, unfeeling murder machine that is, when I'm just, as I'm describing it, I'm like, oh, that's pretty spooky. And they've managed to make him totally unscary. I, Michael Myers is such, it's, you might as well just put in any bland killer. It's not, there's nothing special about Michael Myers anymore. Even in the night, again, this, I, I feel this 2018 film is, is just making me appreciate the original Halloween film slightly more than I did. Because at least in the original Halloween film, Michael Myers had some sort of presence. You were like, okay, all right, this Michael Myers character is a formidable a adversary. There is definitely some scary stuff going on with this guy. But in this film, he just feels so toned down and stripped of any thing that makes him a compelling antagonist. There's nothing going on under the mask. So I, I'm not sure if I have a problem with with that element exactly, um, in part because the way you sort of set up your discussion was by saying that, you know, you didn't find him particularly scary. And I'll admit, I don't find him particularly scary, but I don't find Freddy or Jason particularly scary either. And and. And, and I, and you know, I'm not Friday the 13th is my least favorite of the franchises, but like as much as I love Freddy, I'm not scared by him. You know, so I agree with you. I'm also not scared by Freddy, but I think there's a key difference. I am consistently engaged and there is something going on with Freddy always. Like there's a character there. Michael Myers is just a stand in. He's just there in this film to just be the thing that kills. There is nothing that required, to, uh, there's nothing that demands that this be a Halloween film because none of the, the key things that the filmmakers from the original Halloween used to make Michael Myers so effective as an antagonist are present in this film. They've stripped any uniqueness of the character of Michael Myers and they've just, it's just so generic and uns ultimately unsatisfying in, in my opinion. To me, I actually see that as one of the things Michael Myers as a character has going for him um, in that you're right. 
we're engaging with Freddie in a way that is is just very unique um, to to Freddie. Um, with with Jason, you know, there's a, a clear morality tale of you know, don't have sex when you should be watching small children. Um, but but because the, that story is so linked to the place, um, in a way that I don't even. I mean, obviously, you know, Michael Myers is associated with Haddonfield, but but Jason is is Camp Crystal Lake, right? Yeah. Um, so to me, one of the things that I actually think works and, and it has um, in its favor is this idea that we have been taught for so long that horror happens because of some incredibly rich, complicated backstory, right? Um, well, uh, Nancy, the truth is, is that your mom and dad kind of killed someone <laughs> and now you're paying the price. Um, you know, well, camp counselors, maybe you should have listened when people told you the camp was haunted. But I feel like what, what Michael Myers is offering us is a reminder that in suburbia, which has been removed of history, and one of its selling points is that it doesn't possess the history of, say, Candyman's Cabrini Green, um, or even just of, like that Gothic castle. Like it, it's it's all about the future that within that you can still be haunted by by this figure despite not having this elaborate backstory um and so i actually see that as a selling point for the michael myers character but you are right that one of the affects of that is that you're not going to feel as invested in the story because that's been removed from us i, I think another the another problem with it is that that element has been done more effectively in other horror texts. It's been done more effectively in a in the Strangers, which we have talked about at length on this podcast already. There are many horror texts that are, are playing with that idea of, oh, you think you're safe in suburbia? Ha, psych. Sometimes random things happen to to just random people for no clear reason. And I don't, but I also, and I ultimately don't think that's what this film is arguing, though, either, because it is so linked to Laurie. It is, Michael Myers both does have a clear connect, he's purpose, he's going to kill Laurie, but also they want to have, they want to have their cake and eat it too. And that, so that's what I'm, I am referring to when I'm discussing how, at least in the 19, original 1978 Halloween film, I feel that Michael Myers was more consistent in that they, in how, he operated in this he's just an op he is just a figure that exists to kill and sometimes that is at random and sometimes it's specifically for it driven to lori when this film remembers that it has to have a plot so two things the the first is is that i think um to your point that it's been be done better elsewhere while i would agree with that i think we have to remember that it those other films were able to do that in part because of the 78 Halloween. So, I, which I acknowledge. Right. I, so, I agree. And so in that respect, I think you're right that um, holding off on, on the 20, 2018 film for just a second, Myers gives us something in the 78 film that is original, that is unique, that is um, kind of prov thought provoking, even if it's not the most backstory rich uh, element. And it is an intriguing decision on the part of the filmmakers for 2018 to first completely strip away all that prior history, right? So the franchise um, decided along the way to, to give him a backstory, right? To make him actually have a familial relationship with um, Lori and, you know, to be that it's her brother and, you know, on to kind of complicate the story all along and so this film actively has a line you know where someone's like isn't that you know her brother and then they're like no that's just one of the the incorrect stories so you know this so this film has made an intentional decision to take away his his past um literally as well as figuratively what i think you are correct though in in your criticism is that and it goes back to this to this this other issue is that there is a tension between what I think the film knew it needed to do and what the film ultimately got stuck doing. Um, and then again, with removing the filmmakers, because I don't know how much they decided things versus being told things uh, versus whatever, but, but 
so much of this film with um, Laurie's character is about deconstructing the sort of neatly set up binaries that define the slasher film. Mm-hmm. And so much of, of her daughter and her granddaughter as well, right? Because we see that her granddaughter, um, you know, is does drink and party, but she's still, you know, a quote, um, decent-ish person, right? She's still going to be a final girl. Um, and and we see that, you know, uh, Judy Greer's character's going to still be that very, like you said, sort of uh, in the realm of domesticity, but she also knows how to wield a weapon, Um uh, Right. So we have that, right? We have the film saying that that in a trauma-based narrative, we can no longer have binaries as we understand them. But then the film also spends so much of its narrative trying to set up the ultimate binary, which is that who is Michael Myers? He is a monster. That's all he is, right? He's not he's not misunderstood or complicated or um, haunted by a tragic past um, or even entirely a psychopath, right? Like he is monster, um, and it is difficult, if not impossible, to present both of those readings of this world at the same time. Yeah. One is because one is ultimately affirmative and one is disaffirmative. And so because of the nature of both of those things and because affirmative and disaffirmative horror quite literally are opposites, trying to jam them together is going to feel unsatisfying, messy, and a little bit confusing because there are two extremes and trying to make them work together doesn't always work. Yes. And and just in case, uh, for those of you listening who have missed the many times we've talked about affirmative versus disaffirmative, in this affirmative specifically would be the idea that, you know, it's okay um, that, you know, who we are is okay because this outside threat, this monster um, who was not a socially constructed thing, who is not the product of his system or upbringing or anything um, is the threat and we've destroyed him. And now we can return back to the beautiful, happy family. Right. Whereas the disaffirmative element, uh, which again really comes from, from Lori and her story is the fact that the home can be both a site of, of healing and trauma. It can be both a space of traps and, and of freedom um you know it can be a place where you survive but you also um are scarred right uh and so we see all of that and and i think i think that's a lovely way to to describe it there's a tension between giving us the affirmative horror that is the slasher film that is every slasher film i think um or most slasher films and the disaffirmative element that that the filmmakers knew because they wrote that last act, knew it was where we needed to go with Lori. Ultim- and ultimately, I think I would have at least found, I would have I would have enjoyed this film more. One, well, they could have made me enjoy it a lot more if they had just made that disaffirmative horror film that focused solely on Jamie Lee Curtis and her trauma and that aspect of it. Or they could have made a film that I know I wouldn't have liked, but I think would have felt more cohesive and satisfying if they had gone fully affirmative horror and just done more of a beat for beat remake of the original Halloween. Cause I imagine that would, would have been what it had turned into because Halloween is definitely affirmative. They just would have maybe updated it slightly. And instead what we're presented with is this hodgepodge grab bag of pick your horror type. We're going to do it all, which, ultimately was very deeply unsatisfying for me. What you just described, I have complained about in other films, right? So so then it leads me to ask, what is it about this film that I am willing to set aside its flaws, um, that are flaws that I sometimes have said in other films or make it or break it moments for me? And I think it does come down to the fact that the disaffirmative components, that the part where Laurie's story becomes the most compelling and interesting does happen in the conclusion. And so I am willing to read everything else as almost like the gateway drug to get Halloween 1978 fans ready and able to handle the the Lori story that we're going to get at the end. That almost they were like, you know, they're not ready yet. Hold off. We just got to kill one more babysitter and then we can get there. And, and I don't you know, again, I highly doubt that was their intention. 
But for me, it felt like slowly they were shedding the skin uh, and every bit by bit, not always effectively, but shedding skin is gross and doesn't always happen effectively until we could get to uh, that final moment where we could understand what this franchise means. I just wish we had cut that hand holding of like trying to ease the fan, diehard fans of 1978 Halloween into this story and just had been like, well, this is not Halloween 1978. This is Halloween 2018. And this is the story we're telling. I don't see it as hand holding so much as building a bridge, right? I'm afraid if they had just made the film that you and I imagined could have been more successful that people would have just seen them as, as you you either like the 1978 film or you like the 2018 film, but they are not, they are not the same, right? There's this river running between them. And, and I felt that the majority of the film was helping people cross the bridge, right? And I don't think people would, I don't think you would describe like building a bridge as, as hand holding. It's just what one has to do since we cannot fly or swim. Um, so for me, it was less hand holding and it was more, the only way that we could have an actual connection between the 78 and the 2018. Thank you so very much for joining us for Halloween Take Two. We will be able to continue for the foreseeable future uh, with our Halloween episodes on a Halloween film, much to Anthony's delight. Uh, so please be prepared for next year when hopefully Halloween Kills will come out and then we can go to Halloween 2 and we can just work our way down the list. Uh, in the meantime, though, we have lots of regular episodes uh, are part of our regular uh, series. And so we encourage you to listen to those episodes uh, and then to also follow us on our social media pages, the descriptions of which can be found in the description of this very podcast. Also, feel free to give us a rating wherever you get your podcasts from. Those ratings really help us get out get out there and help boost our podcast and feel free to share us with your friends in the meantime have a great day and thank you for listening happy halloween happy halloween